Greetings and welcome to the Elephant TV. Uh, my name is Joe Kobothi. Uh, today I'll be speaking to Mr. Daniel Kalinaki. Uh, Mr. Kalinaki is an author, is a journalist, a social and political commentator, and currently is the interim chair uh, for Uganda Editors Guild. Uh, welcome Kalinaki to the Elephant TV. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. Uh, great. I think, uh, and uh, th since we are, I've talked to you before the interview starts, so I, I know you're well, I know, I know your family as well. I'd just like to start this interview uh, just with, uh, with a leading question around uh, the election of 2021. Uh, in your view, what, what's, what's the biggest significance to these elections to uh, the present, but also the future of Uganda in many ways as well, even the past of, of Uganda? Uh, thanks, Joe. There are many um, first of things that uh, happened in this election that um, will probably have significance going forward, but also explain the way Uganda is. Uh, the first is that you had um, four generals um, or four military officers uh, on the ballot. So you had, you know, um, you didn't have one of Kiza Besige who's been the perennial contender, but then in his place you had, for instance, Major General Mugisha Muntu, who was a former army commander, and then you had Lieutenant General Henry Mukonde, um, and then of course you had uh, General Yawari Kagutam Seveni. It's, it shows the extent of military entrenchment in the country's politics, that therefore Besige wasn't merely an outlier who just happened to be either in the army or had crossed into politics, but that even in his absence, you then have, uh, you know, senior military officers trying to uh, contest a political office. It shows you how the more things have changed in Uganda in terms of trying to return to civilian rule, the more the military remains um, a key um, kind of factor. The other thing, of course, is that you then had the youngest, uh, most serious contender. You had the youngest candidate, uh, 24, 25 year old, you know, Jokila um, fellow. But the guy who ended up being the biggest um, threat, as it were, uh, Bobby Wine or Robert Chagall in Centre at 38, going on 39, is the youngest serious contender against. Um, you know, we've seen in the elections since 1996. Right. Which tells you, again, it reflects the age demographic of the country. Uganda mm -hmm. is a young country. The median age is just under 16. And you now have kind of the third component of that is that you have a generation that did not participate personally in the military adventures of the past regime. So they didn't fight in the bush war they, um, so they have no military association, now becoming politically uh, active. So you have um, a youth factor, you have a military factor, and then you have the kind of the, the, the other interesting bit about, about it is you had the ghetto coming into the politics. So you've had a political elite over the years, in our case, a political military elite that seem to dominate the political space. And most of the um, younger people, the urban um, kind of masses were mere participants, right? right. So you had the peasants, the mm -hmm. villages, and then you have the urban young people who merely participate. This time they were contestants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then created a very interesting dynamic because you know, no one knew how, how do these guys, um, how do they do politics? You know, they, they're not merely talking about policy. They are ungovernable. They are in your face. Um, they are, you know, very defiant. Uh, they're very fearless. So even the tools necessary to contain them, we saw a change in, you know, how that happened. Right. Is that and so I mean, so I mean, you're right. So I mean, your two two things are stand out. One is that I mean, I mean, which is rarely talked about is that I mean, there are other generals actually apart from Museveni, uh, who 
who are actually contending. So just showing how the militarization of Ugandan politics. But then we have this new uh, new wave, not, not just of Buen as a, as a young contender, but also the demography that he represents, you know, the, the urban poor, uh, the working class. So, I mean, to, to just to move the conversation forward, and what, what does what does then what did Bobby Wine represent to this new to these elections and to the future of Uganda? I think he represented a couple of things. The first is that young people are tired of being told they're the leaders of tomorrow. Right. So, you know, one of the common things was you know he's not ready. You know, he will, he has time. Um, but these these you know, and they, I use the word kids not in a derogatory way. Right. These kids. Um, they're not willing to wait. They, they, they've had this song, you know, so many times that you can't tell them they're not ready, right? Um, if you've been in a government, you've been in a country where one guy has been in power for 35 years, being told you're not yet ready sounds very self-serving. So mm -hmm. they want, as they want uh, to be judged now. But the other thing that has also happened that I think represents is that because of the violence that has been meted out towards him, he has managed to demystify the narrative that has been built that BSJ was a violent person or that the problem wasn't um, you know, the, the state itself, but that the computational manner of BSJ's candidature mm -hmm. and politics was the, the, the contest ended up being violent. I think he has demonstrated that the state is inherently violent and will, um, you know, dispense of violence uh, to protect itself. The final thing is, I think he represents the inequity uh, that we've seen in um, Ugandan society. So he right. had, you know, fairly economic growth consistently uh, for very many years. Um, but Uganda is one of those countries that has had a long trajectory of economic growth over the years. Right. But it's not trickling down to, you know, because of corruption, because of the entrenchment, because of the absence of, of change, the same guys get richer and richer every year, and then more people just remain poor. So mm. it's a case of the Aryans at the gate uh, knocking in and saying, we want um, a share of the cake. Yeah, but but these barbarians that they get, you know, represented by Bobby Wine in 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 eighty six, there was a, a New York Times uh, column uh, talked of Museveni as a young, you know, vibrant, intelligent future of the not just of of Uganda, but then to the future of the continent. You know, this new wave because it six a couple of years down the line uh, was you know was the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the democratization of the world etc that kind of thing. But similarly, you know, similarly, the international uh, media is painting Bobby Wine in, in the same vein. Uh, as a cautionary tale, uh, what, what does this mean? Does it mean that uh, even if Bobby Wine comes in, what's the difference? Um, I think you're right to, to kind of raise the cautionary tale because, um, the, and it's interesting that you referenced the New York Times because the Western world and its institutions, including the press, tend to have a templated view of you know, things in Africa. Mm -hmm. So you have a good guy, a bad guy, um, there's a protagonist, you know, throwing a few kind of local identifiers, and then you have um, you know, kind of the storyline. So yes, many of the things that were said about Bobby Wine um, kind of re make reference to them seven event. And seeing what has happened to Uganda under the NRA, NRM rule, mm. we must be very careful not to um, um, kind of follow the same path. Because right. Bobby Wine, I think, you know, did so much um, praise for the courage he's demonstrated. For you know, he he was he was a man of means. He could still have you know, kind of lived well as a musician, he was a popular musician, uh, he's taken body blows. But we need to go from individualizing the solution to examining the underlying um, structure of the state and society. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, the, the young guys around Bobby Wine and, you know, who, you know, are knocking on the door, 
we had them, Sovini had them. Many of the generals today uh, who've become fabulously wealthy were really young, poor, um, you know, soldiers. And the moment they got into power, they went on to just kind of grab whatever they could. If we don't change the underlying structure and build the institutions of governance that can restrain leaders, then you simply replace one um, dictator as probably when this spread from 70 with another person who might be less of a dictator, but probably not more competent. So we should not be very hagiographic. We should, I think, um, ask tough questions, but the questions really now are beyond individuals. I think they're Thanks. at the level of uh, what makes us Ugandan and why should we actually be in this basket called Uganda? Right. I mean, I, I like I like I like that that note, note that you're taking. You know, really examining the legitimacy of society, which leads me to I mean to to, to the next question. Uh, you know, the place for electoral authoritarianism uh, in the last couple of years. Not 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 just in not just in Uganda, but even here in Kenya, uh, Tanzania. We saw it in Tanzania uh, and many other countries across across the region. There's been a growing. Uh, sense of electoral authoritarianism, where uh, countries uh, just inform, just inform a practice democracy, but substance is very dictatorial, very fascist, and it goes, and I think it goes to the, even the place for really talking about uh, relationship between the state and society. So then, for for Uganda now, because I mean we're seeing um, yesterday uh, the EU and. Uh, other international actors, a diplomatic call wine or with Bobby Wine, the day before yesterday, sorry, were in his house, you know, and saying, and, and he said that he's going to follow uh, the rule of law, go to court. But it begs a question because basically did the same thing. Uh, again, we know what, what happened. Bobby Wine is here. But it begs a question then if that do elections work for Uganda? And if they don't work, what needs to be done? Um, that's a fantastic question, Joe. And you mentioned Bessie. In my book, um, there's a Bessie and Uganda's Unfinished Revolution. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, you know, it starts out with a meeting between Bessie and donors um, mm. or diplomats of the uh, 2011 election. And in which, you know, they were basically saying you should, you know, put stability first, you should, you know, um, you peaceful protests and so on and so forth. And we're seeing the same thing happening in the right. Precisely. My own sense, yeah, my own sense is that this wave of democracy as we see it, first and foremost, was merely uh, templated and handed to us. Um, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, then the trade-off, uh, you know, the structure adjustment programs, we will, mm -hmm. you know, give you aid or we'll fund you, but you have economies, you have to have multi party politics. I don't think the societies, you know, had the in articulated interest groups necessary to then seize and kind of mold interests, you know, through this multi party dispensation. Then they demonized what was, you know, sectarianism, so to speak. Right. So people couldn't mobilize it. Ethnicity, around, you see. around you know, ethnicity, around uh, religion. Right. Yet they were, you know, you didn't have a middle class in most countries. You didn't have the classes. You didn't have the bourgeoisie. You Precisely. You didn't have, you know, the petty bourgeoisie. You didn't have the, the proletariat. So, what are then what then has happened is that these countries have pretended to be democratic mm -hmm. merely to present some level of stability to allow foreign capital come and extract value. Mm -hmm. right. And there's a contestation towards that stability, right. then the Western interests mm -hmm. will choose rather than change right right so you know seven was presenting stability yes right? think yeah if you look at zimbabwe i think worse things have happened in uganda in the last years than happened in zimbabwe right during that time but while zimbabwe would get sanctions while you know mugabe was was demonized 
Uganda kind of, you know, they look the other way. It's mm -hmm. the price for stability. So I think we're getting to a point where we need to challenge the real elephant in the room, which is whose countries are these and who, who do these countries serve? Right, right. Because in most cases, the citizens of these countries are merely participants right. in the politics, in the economics, mm. right, and right. in the governance of the country. Mm. But what does, because once you get to the point of who should Uganda serve, right, right, mm. then the second question of who should then govern the country, who should lead the country, it will emerge organically. Now, I don't think it's a case of do you have um, benevolent dictatorships or uh, you know kind of Western style democracy rhythm based on what has development and all these kind of Western institutions look good on paper. What has really happened in effect is that the guys in power have learned to manipulate them. Right. So right. We'll give you a parliament. We'll give you. We'll allow political parties. You know, um, whereby. Yeah. Our own party is the state. No, you can't defeat us. A judiciary. Like, yeah, a judiciary where we appoint the judges. Um, you know, a press that appears, you know, uh, vibrant, but which we can control. Right. Um, and then we'll, we'll give you an election every five years. Mm. So we, we might kill people, try and win the election. But once we're then declared the winners of the election, we have renewed our popular mandate then, you know, forget about everything else that has happened. I think we're getting to a point where either people are going to lose faith in democracy and resort to violent means of uh, regime change, or we need to re-examine not just the democracy, but the notion of whose democracy and which country, who, who do these countries serve? Mm. And you're then getting into capital. You're basically going back to existential uh, precisely discussions of the state exactly which is uh, which, which is actually my where i want to add to this conversation i mean you, you're right i mean whose democracy and who be, which these countries belong to who and who, who who do they serve then i mean in a sense then if not just in uganda because we are seeing that you'll see here in kenya if this performative a uh, performative role of of democracy this veneer this veneer of capital, as, as, as you rightly said, is, is now beginning to, uh, the veil of ignorance is beginning to drop off the scales and people are beginning to see that, look, wait, actually, uh, this state does not serve us. It's, it has never served us. And uh, 50, 60 years in most African countries of independence, uh, the, the, the idea, you know, the, the dream of independence here in Kenya, it was to eradicate poverty, disease and ignorance, 60 years with singing that song. And it's now dropping, you know, the narrative is dropping. And we're beginning now to clearly see that the actors, the, 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 stay, the, stay, the, the, the actors that were left behind to manage these states for global capital are now being revealed. Then, then what conversation should we be having? But in, in the corners of Uganda, what, what conversation should we now, should now be having? Now, even as now a new generation is coming that is uh, by and large, more exposed globally because of internet and digital media, and they have history to glean on. And uh, I mean, like here in Kenya, we're now a generation where is a three generations of poverty, whereby their grandfathers were promised the fruits of independence, their fathers fruits of independence, and now their sons fruits of independence. And and it's it's spewing different uh, notions, narratives within the political space. Then what conversation should we be having? Not just in Uganda. But even for, I think, just by and large, because we share a lot of similarities around the nature of the state, but how, what's the pertinent conversation to have around the state? Um, and it's not even just within the region. Precisely. Um, if you see the right pumpism, mm. if you see Brexit, right. you have, um, you know, even in countries that have a history of exploitation, Right. Even in those countries, you have segments of the population that feel they have not benefited, right, mm. from the economic surplus that has been created. Right. And then they vent their animosity towards the political elite, right? So, right. you know, Trump comes in and says, 
uh, it's going to attack the elite, it's going to drain the swamp. The British say, you know, let's get out of the EU, you know, manage our affairs, you know, hungering back to empire. In our case, so a similar thing is happening. The only difference is that many of these countries, the main actors in the opposition still regard the Western influence as mm -hmm. one that is progressive and good for them. Right. Usually because you know they're the they are the, they're the ones that provide you know funding, the ones that provide support, the ones that provide the voice. Mm. However, sooner or later, unless we address these things, they will begin to see them as part of the problem. And in fact, as the facilitators and the enablers of the bad governance, which as long as it's stable enough for capital to work and extract value then allows it to continue. Mm, right. So you're then going to have a backlash against you know, Western capital, uh, perhaps even against Western um, ideas, you know, uh, countries and representation. Right. And ideas, especially ideas, right? Mm. So, you know, you're going to see radicalization of young people. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the emergence uh, of extremism. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an environment within which those countries that don't pretend to interfere in the internal affairs, you know, China, Russia, then become quite appealing mm -hmm. to the ruling class, right? Okay. Which then, you know, so the, so the, the democratic dividend that we saw in terms of, you know, just kind of rights or libertarianism mm -hmm. then comes under attack. Right. So you know, my sense is that the the Western value system um, can't continue to exist hypocritically. Right. Either you know pushes political, economic, and social you know, reform. It can't just deepen democracy. Yeah. It also must deepen economic, exactly, and social reforms. Right. Mm, yes. And the other thing you know that we you know the Bobby Wine generation. Um, you know, the 38 year olds, 40, 40, 45 year olds, these are the kids whose parents suffered the structural adjustment program. Precisely. These are the kids that ended up in the ghetto in some cases because their parents, you know, were thrown out of the council houses, they were, mm -hmm. you know, thrown out of, you know, they were laid off and they couldn't go back to the village. So they are around the, they're around the cities, right? They didn't choose that life. That no. life chose them. Yes. And now they're, they're mature, they have families. They're not going to go back to the villages. Yeah, they're going to contest that space, and if it's not managed well, it's going to be violent. Wow! Hey, wow! So, so then, I mean, so just, just, I mean, so you're right. I mean, there's going to be a backlash of of, of some of these ideas. But a quick question is that, uh, just to picking back on, on what you said, that who owns these states? Uh, in many countries, are uh, the political class. You know, the our uh, petite bourgeoisie, you know, if you is is a manufactured elite, whereby they, they echo, they echo, and they reflect uh, by and large Western values because uh, because the states the states are still appendages of global capital, right? So even so, my question is that if, even if they say even if they they move to nativism and extremism, but their 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 normative frameworks are very Western. So what then happens to them? Because I say this, uh, I say this because uh, looking at, uh, for instance, uh, the Ugandan, last Ugandan elections, how there's been a sense in which uh, Museveni feels betrayed by his previous previous allies. It's almost as there's been a, just a quick shift of saying it's time for you to go, and 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 in places like in Kenya where there's been uh, since to to the, the level our our not just Kenya, but a lot large, large parts of Africa where our relationship with uh, China has even increased in terms of uh, uh, debt, in terms of economic uh, aid, has really come from the East. But still, in as much as they do this, they still, in a sense, a shift that our political class can't, can't jump and now say, we're not going to serve the, uh, our Eastern masters or the, our Eastern, Eastern masters because in a sense, they're still, they still they still find their meaning and existence within a, a Western normative framework. So then, 
what, what happens in this interim? I think, so, you know, the, the interesting thing is, and I do reference to Kenya, I think when eventually the Kenyan, what was left of the Kenyan middle class decided it was time for Moi to go. Right. They then came together in, you know, this grand coalition, the NAC coalition. Yes, yes. And, and I think what Kenya had or has more than Uganda is a sufficiently large segment of society that is economically invested in the country. Yes. That where the lack of stability then undermines, you know, their own economic interests. Right. And I think that then allows the settlement after the 2007 election and the post-election violence it also then allows this constant cost trading where different factions, you know, people might move around the dance floor, but they're all on the, you know, in the ballroom. They're not going outside and lobbing grenades through the windows. I think in a country like Uganda, where that local class is still very small and right. insignificant in the grand scheme of things, it is the reason Bobby Wine would have an ambassador before him would receive a delegation of Western diplomats rather than local you know, manufacturers. Right. right. Because you know, if Uganda bans, the natives are mostly, you know, the body the body bags. Right. But in terms of if factories are being torched, banks are being raided, it's all foreign capital. Yes. So we need to get to a point whereby the natives have skin in the game. Right. Mm. If they have skin in the game, then self-interest automatically kicks in. So everyone knows that there is a need for transition. Even people within the government, right, people within the NRM, will say, you know, we need a transition mm. because they haven't. You know, you have a small middle class. You have a small, uh, you know, bourgeoisie uh, of na native bourgeoisie. Then the negotiation for transition is happening between Museveni and his foreign. Backers, right? right? Yes, and the sense of betrayal that is because you know maybe he thinks that they now want to shift, you know, find a new you know person to represent their interests. Yes, in the discussions about the long-term viability of these countries and their politics, as revolutionary as the idea might sound, it might be time to have the natives on the table. Right, because right now they don't we don't have a seat on that table. Exactly. So, I mean, so just again, my, my, this is my last question, just tied to, I mean, having the details on the table. Uh, one, is, is it part of the reason why then uh, Uganda, in a sense, since, since 61, right, since, since, since independence, that Uganda has really never had a peaceful transition of power? Uh, one, and, and if, if that is the reason why is the reason, uh, then how, 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 how do we make, how, how what does Uganda need to do to have peaceful transitions of power moving forward? Because I mean, uh, part of the failure of these elections is that uh, the, the violence meted against the opposition would definitely, will, we can't heal peaceful transition of power. So moving forward, how does Uganda mitigate this transition of power peacefully? I don't think it's too late, even, even in the day, uh, mm. for Mr. Museveni to actually, uh, because the short answer is leadership. Yes. It's someone who has the power to do wrong or right, choosing to do right. Right? Right. And it's not too late, you know, even today, for Mr. Museveni to say, this is my last time in office, right? I've made my contribution. Uh, the party can begin a process of identifying, um, you know, uh, successor. I'm sure many Ugandans might be, you know, unhappy with the ruling party, the NRM. But if given the choice of just seeing a shift from one NRM person in seventy to another NRM person, we would see it as the least worst option, right? Right. And right. See it as a focus. So I don't think it's too late. Um, I think you need leadership. Um, whether Mr. Seven can find it in himself to see that, he keeps saying he's not seen anyone who can, um, you know, <laughs> the vision to. You know, uh, so, 
we don't know whether he will find someone in, you know, 800,000 Ugandans are born every year. So maybe in these five years, we'll find a baby that looks like- <laughs> the, beautiful, the beautiful ones um, of, are yet to be born. <laughs> Exactly. So, um, but the short answer is that leadership. Right. You need a leader that decides. Uh, I'm gonna I've done my bit. I am going to just give that gift of a peaceful transfer of power from one leader to another. And the, the power of example is so important that in Kenya today, having gone through the transfer, you know, from Moi to Kibaki, Kibaki to Nyeta, you know, right now I don't think Kenyatta can try to change the constitution just to change power. He might, you know, come back as a prime minister, whatever, whatever. But just the idea that I want a third term in office because you've seen that the country has not burnt when you've gone from one leader to another, just means that there is no purchase for that kind of idea. And I think Uganda just needs that one peaceful transfer to then begin um, demilitarizing and politicizing the politics. Okay, then I mean, then, then in that sense, then just my last as a concluding question, then what, what next for Uganda? Because in a sense, Uganda is in this space for the next couple of days, uh, seeing Bobby Wine is going to court uh, Museveni. What next for Uganda for the next ca- coming months, uh, perhaps also coming years? What next for Uganda? Will it, will it, will it go into this slow, uh, slow sense of uh, atrophy? Uh, or, or does can Uganda have the potential to actually make the demograph- uh, dem- democratic jump uh, to, to a certain level of political and social and economic uh, growth? Um, so, I mean, the, in the short term, Bobby is going to court. I don't think he will win. I don't think he has, me, he has enough evidence to, to uh, win the substantiality um, argument in, in court. I don't think the judges will give a qualitative argument. I think. Um, safer for them to just do the substantiality argument. Um, What then happens after that is gonna come down to what he wants to do, what the Parandi want to do. Do they want to be aggressive? Do they want to go into parliament and and, build on their moment and do the normative institutions? Fundamentals will not change. Fundamentals are there is a young country with the young population that is restless. Uh, Uganda is a country of ninjas, right. young people who have no income, jobs, no assets. Mm-hmm. And they are hungry and uh, desperate. And whoever is in charge has to create the economic opportunities to allow them to feel that they are part of the country and that the country is working for them. Now, how those tensions manifest and how the government responds to them, I don't know, but the tensions will be there and they will manifest. Okay, thank, thank you so much for, for that for that very elaborate e- ending. Thank you so much, Dan Kananaki, for, for being on Elephant TV. Thanks. For-